just after midnight on February 8th, 2000. Captain Keith Avery of the research vessel RRS Discovery found himself fighting through the heaviest seas he had ever encountered. The 47 scientists and crew on board had embarked on a routine research voyage. Now, throughout the 3,000 ton ship, they braced themselves wherever they could to keep from being thrown around like rag dolls. They were sailing 175 miles off the coast of Scotland, trapped by a series of storms in an area just east of Rockall, a volcanic island nicknamed Waveland for its notoriously unforgiving seas that have claimed more than 1,000 ships. Just when it seemed the situation couldn't get any worse, the RRS Discovery plunged into a deep trough. The ship rolled 28 degrees to port, then heaved 30 degrees back to starboard before a massive wall of water came out of nowhere and towered over the ship. Captain Avery helplessly plunged his ship forward, smashing into the roaring mountain of sea. The deafening sounds of the ship crashing through the torrent seemed to stop time itself until somehow they emerged at the other side. Their ship was bruised and battered. A lifeboat on her foredeck was destroyed. Computers and furnishings were smashed to pieces but the ship managed to survive. For centuries, sailors have told stories of massive walls of water that come out of nowhere and swallow ships in an instant. But these stories were thought to be nothing but legend and hyperbole. The RRS discovery, however, was different. Being a research vessel, she was equipped with sensors that recorded every wave the ship encountered. After their harrowing voyage, one of the ship's two chief scientists, Dr. Penny Holliday, analyzed the data they had recorded. She found that the significant wave height, an average of the largest 33% of waves, was an astonishing 61 feet or 18.6 meters. And the biggest wave they encountered measured a full 95.5 feet or 29.1 meters. They were some of the largest waves ever scientifically recorded. A rogue wave is defined as a wave that reaches a height more than double the significant wave height at the time. Until the phenomenon was first officially recorded by the Dropner gas platform in the Norwegian North Sea in 1995, it was thought that these massive waves existed only in myth. Tall tales told by storm-addled mariners. But a number of well-known ocean liners had their own encounters with these deadly forces of nature. The RMS Lusitania, one of the largest and fastest ships in the world at the time, had her own encounter in 1910 with a wave that nearly doomed the massive liner. Hey crew, you've probably noticed that I end every video by saying be nice to people. That's because no matter who you are or where you're at in life, it's a tough world out there, and I believe that everyone deserves a little bit of kindness, even if it comes from within. One of the nicest things that I ever did for myself was seeking out therapy. I can't even begin to express how much it's helped me manage my anxiety and improve my life. That's why I'm so happy to be talking about this video sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists that can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy so that BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. You can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's through text, chat, phone, or video call. And you can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't right for any reason, you can switch to a new one at no additional cost. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom-picked for you, with more scheduling flexibility and at a more affordable price. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash boats, or you can get started using the link below. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. And now, back to the Lusitania. RMS Lusitania was a record-breaking ship built out of mounting anxiety that British merchant shipping was falling behind. In 1897, the German liner Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross captured the Blue Ribbon, the record for the fastest Atlantic crossing from Cunard's Campania 
and the prize remained in German hands when the Deutschland claimed the record in 1900. At the same time, the American banking mogul JP Morgan, who you may know from that $100 fee on a $2 overdraft, was buying up British shipping companies in an attempt to monopolize transatlantic trade. In 1902, Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company purchased Cunard's biggest rival, the White Star Line, placing its vast fleet under American ownership. This unnerved the British Admiralty, who was concerned that if a war were to break out, their fleet of merchant vessels would be limited and outclassed. With all of that in mind, Cunard approached the British government with a plan for two record-breaking ships that would restore national pride and provide two valuable naval assets if a war was ever to break out. The British government agreed to fund the project with a loan of 2.6 million pounds and an operating subsidy of 75,000 pounds a year with a mail contract that added another 68,000 pounds a year. The Lusitania and Mauritania, both named after Roman provinces, followed strict requirements laid out by the Admiralty that would make it easy to convert the ships into auxiliary cruisers. World War I would quickly show that large ocean liners made for terrible warships, but they didn't realize this at the time. The Lusitania was designed by famed naval architect Leonard Peskett and constructed at the John Brown & Co. shipyards in Clydebank, Scotland. She was laid down on August 17, 1904 and launched on June 7, 1906. Princess Louise was meant to christen the ship, but she could not attend. Instead, Lady Mary Inverclyde, the widow of Cunard's former chairman, christened the new liner. While she would be the largest liner ever constructed at the time of her launch, only barely beat out by the Mauritania a few months later, speed was the number one priority in her design. Parsons Steam Turbines, a novel and relatively untested technology, was selected to power the new ships after a series of trials on smaller vessels proved their potential. The raw power of these new power plants produced 76,000 horsepower that drove four propellers to achieve an impressive service speed of 24 knots. She sailed her maiden voyage on September 7, 1907, and claimed the Blue Ribbon a month later in October of that same year. In order to achieve the maximum possible speed, Lusitania's hull was given a knife's edge bow that was designed to cut through waves rather than ride over them. While this allowed greater speed, it also gave the liner unpredictable stability issues. Both Lusitania and Mauritania were known to unexpectedly drop by the bow, sometimes violently, catching crew and passengers off guard, even in relatively calm seas. Both ships were exceptionally capable, but in heavy seas, this bow design created some harrowing situations. With sloping mast and dipping prayer, the ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. January crossings are notoriously rough, and the winter of 1910 was proving especially challenging as a series of storms moved over the North Atlantic. RMS Lusitania left Queensland, Ireland on the morning of Sunday, January 9th, as part of her routine voyage to New York. From the moment she entered the Irish Channel, she was rocked by heavy seas, and as she cleared the Irish coast, she encountered a fierce west by southwest gale that plagued her throughout the voyage. William Thomas Turner joined the Cunard Line as a fourth officer in 1878. He assumed command of his first ship, the Aleppo, in 1903, and in November 1908, Captain Turner was placed in charge of the Lusitania. By late afternoon, Monday, January 10th, Lusitania was facing strong winds out of the west and large swells, but she was making steady progress at a reduced speed of 14 knots. At 6 p.m., Captain Turner left the bridge to attend dinner with the few passengers who weren't overcome with seasickness. Chief Officer Sandy G.S. McNeil was placed in charge while the captain was away. McNeil was recruited as an officer for the Cunard Line when he was 26 years old. He began his service on the Pavonia and worked his way up through the ranks until he was promoted to Chief Officer of the Umbria in 1905. He was transferred to the Lusitania in 1907. Conditions that day were rough, but nothing too challenging for the great liner. McNeil stood at the bridge railing and watched the storm as they plowed forward. Without warning, the ship dropped from beneath him, violently falling into a particularly deep trough. Briefly stunned, McNeil looked for the horizon, but to his horror, 
All he saw was a massive wall of green water rushing toward them. He sprinted for the wheelhouse, but before he could even shut the door behind him, the massive waves slammed into the ship. The onslaught plunged the bridge into chaos as water overtook McNeil, rising up to his chest. The wheel, still firmly gripped in Quartermaster Ripley's hands, was ripped from the helm as the man was thrown up against the wall that separated the wheelhouse from the chart room. Quartermaster Harding, who was standing nearby, was also swept across the room and suffered a mild leg injury. The water short-circuited the side lights as well as the lights in the foremast, chart room, and wheelhouse, plunging everything into darkness. In the confusion, McNeil struggled to his feet as the now waist-deep water filled with wood splinters swirled all around him. All he remembered seeing was a white-gloved hand whisk past him in the chaos. The hand belonged to a deckhand named Tommy Hughes, who threw himself to the floor as the wall of water slammed into the bridge. He was picked up and swept across the room, only narrowly grabbing hold of an iron stanchion just in time to keep him from washing overboard. Above the bridge, 3rd Officer Story was on the compass platform. He saw the wave coming and clung to the compass stand for dear life as the water smashed over him. As the seawater drained away, McNeil finally came to his senses, and 15 minutes later they were able to switch back on the lights. That's when they realized the full extent of the damage. The force of the wave smashed in most of the windows of the wheelhouse, dented the steel wall, and splintered much of the woodwork. Water rushed through the officer's wardroom and flooded much of the officer's quarters. The forward two starboard lifeboats had been lifted from their davits and smashed into the deck. Their 10-inch iron davits had been twisted by the sheer force of the water. McNeil then realized that his coat and shirt were covered with blood. Sometime in the chaos, he sustained a cut across his head and another on his chin. Miraculously, McNeil's cuts and Quartermaster Harding's leg were the only two injuries reported. Both were mild. Several passengers were startled by the impact, but probably because most of them were in their berths battling seasickness, no one else was seriously injured. Lusitania's bow was unscathed, aside from some damage to the decking on her forecastle. Bulkheads in the forward steward's quarters were slightly warped, and the copper pipes that connected the stern hoisting gear forward were bent. The ship was stopped while the damage was surveyed and quickly patched. Canvas was secured over the bridge windows. Her aft steering gear was used until her wheel could be reattached, and 40 minutes after the wave strike, they were back underway. The incident left permanent depressions in her deck and bridge that remained with the ship for the rest of her career. The Lusitania arrived in New York several hours behind schedule. She was quickly repaired and returned to normal service. It's unknown exactly how large of a wave hit the liner that day, but Captain Turner noted that the top of her wheelhouse was 80 feet or 24.4 meters above the waterline, and the wave easily washed well over it. He remarked to the press that it was the most memorable incident of his career but other events would easily claim that distinction for him a few years later. Chief Officer McNeil was soon promoted to staff captain and transferred to the Mauritania the following year. He was the first Cunard officer to hold that title. He later would serve as captain of the Mauritania. Captain Turner remained with the Lusitania until transferring to another liner in 1912. He was reunited with Lucy in 1915 taking command of the liner as she continued operating passenger voyages despite the outbreak of World War I. On May 7, 1915, he would survive her sinking, an event that would have a profound impact on history. But that's a story for another day. The Lusitania was one of few legendary ships to face the onslaught of a rogue wave. Her size and sturdiness helped her emerge with only superficial damage, but the encounter is a reminder that no matter how large and powerful we build our ships, the sea will always be larger. Thank you so much for watching. What's another rogue wave incident I should cover? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more stories like this one. 
Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Check them out using the link below. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. They would keep hold of the wheel, no matter how big the wave. All right, crew, that's all I've got. Till the next one, be nice to people. <laughs>